I, the message today <clears throat> really was birthed out of something that happened last Monday on my day off. <clears throat> they come in in the evening. You know, we have, <clears throat> with this COVID stuff, we got professional cleaners that come up, come in every night and clean the place. So they're the last ones here. They clean the place up. They lock the place up. <clears throat> but between school being out and uh, the cleaners coming, somebody broke in. And the cleaners apparently uh, scurried them up because they found one of the windows jimmied open in the secretary's office and the computer knocked over. And then the, the cleaners must have come because then they zipped out the back door and they were gone. But it's an indication to me of how the enemy works and the way he works. And so I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. We've, we've got um, cameras everywhere. We've got security everywhere. In fact, even during service, we've got security. So don't try anything strange. Somebody's going to knock you out. <laughs> well, we do. We have professional people that do. So we're, I believe in being prepared. But even the people who are prepared get assaulted. Jesus told a parable. In fact, in Matthew chapter 13, the, the gospel that presents him as king, after he was rejected by the religious leaders and then they killed John the Baptist. And then his family came and took him to take him away because they thought he was kind of crazy. After that, he started telling parables. He didn't tell parables until rejection occurred. And he tells a series of parables beginning in Matthew chapter 13. The first one is the, is the best known. It's the parable of the sower and the seed. The second one is not as well known, but also it is a man went out to sow good seed. But unbeknownst to him, an enemy came and sowed in tares. And so they came and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed? Yes. Then why is there tares mixed with the, with the good seed, with the, with the wheat? And uh, shall we rip it out? He said, no, you'll destroy everything. So don't do that. At the end time, that will come out. But there's an enemy who's at work, and he works trying to get at the church. He works trying to get at Christian people. And uh, as soon as I start talking about this, I know people kind of think we're talking Twilight Zone and stuff like that. There are two extremes people go to. Uh, one is the devil does everything. Then there is no devil of McDonald's and there is no devil of chocolate. Uh, there is no... Demons are an operation, but we can't blame everything on demons. And then the other extreme is we don't blame anything. We just kind of live and do our own thing. In the middle is the balance. And that's where Jesus comes in. The first time he established his, his uh, headquarters in Capernaum was in Mark chapter 1. And he goes into the first service. And in the middle of the service, there's a disruption by an unclean spirit. And Jesus takes authority over the unclean spirit. Now, this is different because you'll find in the Bible that the devil only confronts seven people in all of Scripture. Eve is the first one. In Genesis chapter, chapter 3, uh, Job is the second one when he goes through all of those difficulties, uh, financial and medical and relational, all those things. And David's the third one. Those are three in the Old Testament. And David, you say, David? Yeah, well, David was a king. His king was be forever. And it, it says in 1 Chronicles 21, 21, it says, and the devil uh, seduced David into numbering the children of Israel. You say, what does that mean? It means that David was going to rely on his army and not on the Lord. Whenever you rely on your strength, yourself, and not the Lord, you got problems. Then when Jesus came in, of course, he was tempted by the devil. And then three after that, uh, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Judas, in John chapter 13, verse 2, said, and 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 uh, Satan putting into his heart to do this stuff. And later on in that same chapter, it says, and Satan entered him. And then the last one, of course, is Ananias in Acts chapter 5. So three in the Old Testament, three in the New Testament, then, then Jesus. And all that to say that we all deal with spiritual conflict. 
It comes in different ways, but we all deal with spiritual conflict. And in, in Genesis chapter 3, if we go back to, to Eve once again, can you pull Genesis chapter 3 up? And the woman said to the, uh, okay, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall, you shall eat of every tree of the garden? Verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we made uh, uh, the fruit of the, gar- the tree of the garden, except, verse 3, the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. And that's what God said. You shall not eat it. This is where her husband failed her. And this is what husbands do. Nor shall you touch it. God didn't say that. Adam did. And that's the way husband gets. Now listen, honey, stay away from that tree. You can't eat it. In fact, don't even touch it. That's not what God said. Don't even touch it or you'll die. Verse 4. But see, whenever we misrepresent the word, it creates for people uh, potential for uh, failure. Then the serpent said, this is what he does. He's contrary to the word of God. You will not surely die. So the enemy comes and he tries to, in the middle of the first conflict, he tries to whisper to Eve, God's, God's not good. The reason why he's doing this is because he knows when you're, you, you eat of this tree, you'll be like him. And he wants to keep the best from you. And God is not a good God. God is a, a, an unkind God. God's a, and we get feeling like that sometimes, that God is not good. God is good. Would you agree? God is good, but the conflicts that come in oftentimes come in through subtle whispers into your head about, about three things, about God, about the devil, and about yourself or other people. These whispers that come in, and we're, we're going to get to that in, in just a minute, but, but we're in a conflict now that we need to understand is a spiritual conflict. And everybody hears it. Well, says, no, I'll leave the devil alone. He'll leave me alone. He's not going to leave you alone. He never takes a vacation. He never takes a day off. He never says, oh, that's a pretty good person. Never, never. He is out to destroy your life, your family, and your faith, and that his, his, that's his plan, purpose, and goal for your life. So we are, we are in a conflict that we need to, to understand and to deal with. And uh, you say, well, I, I don't know that I believe this stuff. I read a book in college by M. Scott Peck called The Road Less Traveled. Anybody read that book? M. Scott Peck was a graduate of Harvard. He went on to Case Western Reserve for med school. And then after that, he became uh, deputy uh, surgeon, surgeon general. In the middle of writing these books, the first one was The Road Less Traveled. The second was People of the Lie. And the way he came to Christ was he was, he was a, he's a psychiatrist. He's counseling this woman and, and, and her voice changes and she says, I'm going to destroy you. And he's thinking, whoa, what, what is this all about? Long story short, he comes to realize that the devil's real. He comes to attack people and manifest in a variety of ways. And he committed his life to Christ. And then wrote the book, People of the Lie, because people tend to believe the lie rather than the truth of God's word, that God is good and he wants to help us. And he, he's on our side. All of that is what he wants to do. And so he assaults us and assails us, and uh, that is, that's why the Bible says 20 times in the New Testament, watch, be alert, or be prepared. I was a scout. Anybody here a scout? Okay, four of us. <laughs> the scout motto, be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. Because you never know what's going to happen. So what I'm telling you as believers is, be prepared. That's what Jesus said to them. Be prepared. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be prepared. Because you don't know when this is going to happen. I can tell you this. It is going to happen. If it happened to, to Eve, and it happened to, to Job, happened to David, happened to Peter, happened to, to uh, uh, Judas, happened to Ananias, it can happen to anybody. And so we need to make sure, first of all, that we're prepared for what's going on, that the Lord opens our eyes to what's going on. Uh, Secondly, you're a target. You're a target. We're in a spiritual conflict, and you're a target. Why am I a target? Because the moment you said yes to Jesus, you thought you were saying yes to Jesus, and you were. 
but you're also opening yourself up to an army that's in conflict. We're in conflict. We're not, there's, there's always conflict around the world, but it tells us there's always conflict for believers. We are always in conflict. You say, well, how does that, how does that work? Well, multiple areas, spiritual conflict. There are people who come to church that don't feel good enough to be in church. And the lie, people the lie. They begin to believe, well, I'm not good enough or I've sinned too much or my past disqualifies me. Spiritual areas where we feel like and we're being lied to that I have done something wrong, that I've done the unpardonable sin or I, I should not be here worshiping God. That's a lie. Then it affects us emotionally. A lie does two things. Uh, emotionally, it affects us so that we, we become fearful. If you have anxiety problems, if you have fear problems, it's not a fear problem. It is a lie problem. It's manifest in that, in that, in that way. And, and the other way it's manifest men, uh, mentally is through doubt and confusion. God's not the author of confusion. So you've got these emotions that are, you become moody. Uh, what's wrong with me? I don't know what's wrong. You become angry. So it affects my emotions. It affects my mind. It affects my relationships. When you're a moody person, you're not fun to be around. Who wants to be around somebody who's like, well, when you're like this, it's great. But the next minute you could be down here. So what is wrong with such and such? And that's the way the enemy works. But he also assaults us physically. You mean physically? Let me just tell you three common ways he attacks people physically. Headaches, back aches, stomach aches. Now there's, there's other ways I'm sure. But headaches, back aches, stomach aches. In fact, the Bible calls in, in Luke chapter 13 a spirit of infirmity. And Jesus healed people on seven Sundays. I'm, I'm going to do a series on the, the seven Sundays, the, the, or seven Sabbaths, where Jesus violated the law. But the fifth one occurs in Luke chapter 13 with this woman who's bent over. She had back problems. And Jesus looked at her. And the, now, here's the tragic thing. The religious people are looking to accuse Jesus for what they know he's about to do because Jesus can't be around people who have needs and not make a difference. Wherever Jesus is and you're here today with Jesus, he's going to make a difference in your life because he can't help himself. He loves people. He loves you. And if he sees your problem, you present the problem, he's going to help you with that. That's just, that's just his nature. He is good. He's kind. He's gracious. And so that's just the way he operates. What was I talking about? Spirit infirmity. So this woman's been over. And he says, he, says to, he says to them, this woman has had this spirit infirmity for 18 years. Think of it. 18 years. Should she not be better? And they're more concerned about their law than they are her freedom. And so it's, and here's the interesting thing too. Instead of dealing with the demon... But sometimes you do. Sometimes Jesus did that. He dealt with a woman. And he said, woman, you're released. You're released. And she stands up. And you'd think the people would celebrate, but say, oh, no, we're going to get him for that. He violated the law. That's another story. But uh, we are targets spiritually, physically, Emotionally, mentally, relationally, uh, intimacy, at an intimacy level, the enemy wants to stop you from reproducing. If you have a problem with infertility, that's, Jimmy, we talked about it last week. See, I don't think that is a physical problem. I believe it's a spiritual problem. Because the enemy wants to make you not fruitful and multiply, which is the first command, he wants, to, he wants to neuter you so that you, you don't have kids or don't want to have kids or, or you believe the lie. Well, there's too many people. You know, that lie was going around when I was in college. They wrote books about that when I was in college, and that's when Roe v. Wade passed, when I was in college. This lie has permeated our culture. It's a lie. There's enough food. There's enough room. And we're going we're to be okay, but we target people. And so whenever you have problems like that that are relationally, intimacy with the Lord or intimacy with people, 
It is not an NSP problem. It is a spiritual problem. The enemy is trying to work in your life in that area. God wants you to have good relationships. And he wants you to be physically healthy and whole and mentally sound. A sound mind. He's not giving you a spirit of fear, but authority, love, and a sound mind. But we need to be prepared and understand what we're dealing with when those whispers come into your head that you take authority over those. And I'll get to get to that in my next point. But, but that, uh, that you, you're a target and you realize if you blame God, and there are people who do, you know what happens? They get bitter. I've had this problem for 18 years. Instead of going to the Lord, they get bitter. Now, interesting, when, when the children of Israel were released from Egypt... The first place they came after they left, they, they came to a place called Sukkoth, which is Tabernacles. Now there's the Feast of Sukkoth. Uh, and the second place they went is to a place called Mara. Mara means bitter. Because when they got there, the water was bitter. Hey, what the heck? We come out of here and we got all this. And now we're, we, we got to drink bitter water? And uh, Moses said, Lord, what do I do? And he said, See that, see that tree over there? Yes. Cut it down and throw it into the water. And when he did, he made the bitter waters sweet. Now, bitter, your option, if you've been disappointed or you're dealing with something right now, your option is to be bitter, which has I in the center, or to get better which is to put Jesus in the center and realize that he has taken from us the curse because curse everybody who hangs on the tree that we might receive blessing. And part of the blessing is in all these different areas. God wants to bless our lives. So he comes to make the bitter sweet. And if you're bitter here today because of of a church or a pastor or another Christian or a Christian businessman, listen, listen, Put it under the cross. Make the bitter sweet. Choose sweetness. How do you choose sweetness? Lord, I just bring this to you. I put this out of the foot, foot of the cross. You're the one that can deal with this, and so I, I give this to you because uh, the target is to make, if he can't make you not a Christian, the next best thing is to make you an ineffective Christian, and toxic Christians are ineffective people. Who wants to be around somebody who's toxic? Who's complaining and critical and all that? Well, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, don't, I know this place will be just like blah, blah, blah. If you're looking for wrong, you'll find it. If you're looking for faults, you'll find it. If you're looking for somebody around you who's not going to be nice, you'll find it. But if you're looking for a nice, friendly place with a wonderful pastor <laughs> and nice people, loving people, you'll find it. And two people come into the same place and leave with different attitudes. And it's not because of the place. It's because of the person. Let the bitter become sweet. Turn your bitter into sweetness. And so Moses did. And Mara, the place called Mara, now is a place called sweetness. Turn to somebody and say, you are sweet. <laughs> if you're not married to them, forgive me. Uh, uh. Now, I'll tell you how that affects us, because all of us are vulnerable. Anybody here ever been in the uh, Army, Navy, military? Anybody here? Any police officers here? Yes. Peter, come on up, would you? You're a likely candidate for this. Peter is our Canadian policeman who's now down here in away from that communist country. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, my understanding is, and I've, I've gotten this from my son, Johnny, who's upstairs, uh, that they teach you vulnerable points for people. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's correct. So if somebody attacks you, uh, there are places where you can counterattack because they're vulnerable. That's right. Now, see if I've got this. Now, I get this from Miss Congeniality also. <laughs> Sandra Bullock. Mm -hmm. Remember that? You're not going to do that. I'm not going I'm, I'm to hurt you in any way because I know you can beat me up. But 
when you're confronted by somebody, where are the vulnerable places? Can you? Uh, the neck, the groin, uh, any joints. Those are the big ones. Sing. Let me just put the way I heard it. Sing. When someone gets you, stomach, S, in step, I, nose. You want to really hurt somebody, jam your fist, right? Not their fist, just your hand, right? In their nose or their knees. Yeah, I know you're going to spell knees with an N, but for today we will. S, I, N, and G is ouch. Right? Right. Correct. Now the enemy knows where we're vulnerable. And here's, here's how you can tell if somebody's been, this vulnerability has been exploited because people who should sing don't sing anymore. It's true. I know it's a play on words, but it's true. If the enemy can stop you from singing, he's got you at one of those points. He's either kicked you in the groin or the stomach or the throat or wherever he's gone. Thanks, that's good, thank you. So when you're confronted, what do you do? Sing. Put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. He comes in, he lies to us, he affects our, our mind, he affects our emotions. Sing. And you can think about that too. I'm, I'm dealing with this, I'm in stump. You can do all of that stuff, but the, the spiritual weapon is singing. Well, what about spiritual weapons? Well, we need to arm ourselves. Ephesians chapter 6, I want to take you there, and I could spend a whole time which we don't have time for today, but I just want to get to it to start. I just want to start this today. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the book of Ephesians is divided into three sections. Section 1 is chapter 1, 2, and 3, where it says we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are seated you're seated. Are you relaxed? Yes. Comfortable? Yes. That's the way the Lord wants you to live. Relaxed and comfortable. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because the problem is too often we don't rest. And that's, the, that's why it says, verse, uh, let me pick up here. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, or a lot of them, of wickedness uh, in, 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 uh, in, in heavenly places. Therefore, therefore, because we're dealing with beings that we cannot see, and that's their chief attribute, therefore, because we're dealing with those beings, let me encourage you, take up the whole armor of God. And that's a command, to take up or receive. That's a better word. Receive. Uh, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in that evil day and having done all to stand. So I was telling you, the first part of Ephesians is to sit. The second part in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 1, the, this is the way that falls out in the Bible. Uh, walk worthy of the calling. We're to walk worthy. We're to walk in light. We're to walk in love. That, that section, 4 and 5, is how we're supposed to walk. And it says, and then that's where, that's where the, the husband and wife is. You know, husband, you know, love your wife as well of the church. Wife, submit yourself to their husband as to the Lord. And, and, and it goes down, he says, now finally all of you, children, servants, all, all of you understand this. We're in a battle. And it's not against flesh and blood. It's against spirit. And therefore, you need to arm yourselves for victory. How many of you want to be victorious? So you need to arm yourself for victory. And we'll say, what is that? Well, there are seven pieces of armor here, and obviously we don't have time to do that today. We'll get to that next week uh, uh, or sometime. <laughs> I wasn't planning on doing this one today, so we'll see. But I'm going to read this. Uh, stand there. Having done all to stand, stand there for. So we sit. We relax in Jesus because we're seated in heavenly places. We walk. We walk worthy of the call that he's called us. We walk, in, we walk in light. We walk in love. And then we stand. Having done all that, finally stand. We're standing against the enemy. And, and stand, therefore, having girded your, your waist with truth. So the first, the first of seven is the belt of truth, the waist of truth. The starting point that he starts is, is truth because the opposite of truth is what? 
A lie. And the enemy comes to lie to us. And so this is the truth. When Jesus said it is finished, what was finished? Everything you have need of. It's finished. He did all the work so you don't have to do the work. That's the gospel. He did all the work. You don't have to do the work. And here's the, here's the problem. If you work, he won't work. Let me say that again. If you work, he'll stop working. But if you don't work, he'll work. The Bible says, I will contend with those who contend with you. So I can tell you, when I went to the problem, I said, Lord, I just give this to you instead of battling. Because if you have battled, you better be very, very, very good at battling because you're on your own. But you say, Lord, I give this to you. This, this problem is yours. He'll battle for you. Who would you rather fight, you or the Lord? Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understand, your own way of battling. Acknowledge him, and he'll give, he'll give clear direction. He gives direction in church all the time because you're not battling anymore. You're sitting down, and you're resting. And we got to rest. we got to put that truth on us that there's nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do to please God. He's pleased because you're his child. And because you said yes to him, that's it. That's it. That's all you got to do is say yes to him. The second one is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, the breastplate is what covers the vital organs, and it covers primarily the heart. The book of Proverbs chapter 4 says, uh, guard your heart with all diligence because out of it comes the issues of life. Listen, th the matter that goes on is the heart. The enemy tries to get at your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can tell somebody where somebody's heart is by how they're talking, what they're saying. So he wants us to have our heart guarded by a breastplate of righteousness. What does that mean? It means that what he did for you to protect your heart, you don't have to do anymore. Grace is greater than all your sin. Grace is is the thing that erases all your sin. And righteousness is not what you come to give. Please hear this. Righteousness is not what you bring to Christ. It's what he brings to you. So many people, and I've been in church all my life and didn't know this until, until I was 19 years old. Well, then, then after that, when I committed to Christ, I learned that. But he comes because he sees you as righteous. By one man's sin, sin in the race. Also by one man's righteousness, righteousness enters the race. And, and, and he comes to give a gift, the gift of abundance of grace and righteousness. So you are righteous. Now you're sitting there, and this is hard to say, but I want you to say it. I am righteous. <laughs> say it like you mean it. <laughs> Turn to somebody next to him and say, you're righteous. Now, I am not saying that they're perfect. And I'm not saying that they have not sinned. What I'm telling you is when the enemy comes, and he does, and oftentimes in service times, and he will accuse you. How dare you sit in church? How dare you say that? Because, and then he'll bring up to your past or things where you failed. Because everybody here has failed, right? And he is the accuser. He's the DA who says, you are guilty. How do you plead? And this is what you say. I plead the blood of Jesus. Amen. That's why that hymn is. I have no argument. I have no plea. It's enough that he died and he died for me. I plead the blood of Jesus. That's what it's talking about. I am covered by the blood of Jesus. I am forgiven because when he said it is finished, it was finished for me. And so now he brings to me a robe of righteous, righteousness. And so it's this thing of what he, who he says I am and who I'm to become and this progression of where I am right now to become more like him. That's a lifetime, becoming more like him, thinking more like him, talking more like him. Because nobody, nobody is there yet. Nobody's there. I'm closer than most of you. I kid. None of us are there. But he declares us to be righteous. So we put on the, the heart because what he attacks is it attacks our heart. Puts doubt in. You know who you are. Puts that lie, that fear, that, that anxiety, that doubt. 
You are righteous. That's why I wanted to declare that. So the breastplate of righteousness, got to scoot, got to scoot. Um, uh, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace. The foundation, the foundation of anything is critical, whether you're talking about a house or where you're going to fight. You fight from a place of a solid foundation, and the foundation is peace. Ephesians chapter 2, he is our peace who's broken down every wall. He preached peace. He is our peace. Jesus is our peace. If you're missing peace today, I want you to know Jesus is the source of peace. Don't let anybody take you, take peace from you, joy from you, or peace from you, or love from you. Jesus is the source of all of that. He is our peace. And so have your feet walk with a sense of peace. That blessed are the peacemakers are called the children of God. That, that wherever you go, whatever you do, that you bring peace and not, not calamity. Uh, and so that's, that's the foundation that we fight from is that peace. Uh, verse, verse uh, where are we at here? 16, above all, that's not, this is not more important, but above all, make sure that you take the shield of faith by which you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, wicked one. The shield of faith. Now, in their day, they had an oblong shield, and when, when they would start shooting arrows that way, you, you've seen it in, uh, in uh, if you've seen, what's the name of that movie? Braveheart. Braveheart, yes. You know, you see, anybody seen Braveheart? Okay, so you know, I'm, I put the thing up, and then they do the, I love that, I love that, I love that. So forgive me, but uh, I love, they put these things up, and these darts come. Listen, darts come. The fiery darts. The word darts is balos. It's where we get the idea of ballistic missiles. Missiles come our way. Or I'm just going to shoot them an email. I'm going to shoot a text. And that thing comes and you don't recognize where it's from. It's a fiery dart from hell. So what do you do? Shield of faith. Lord, guard my heart. Keep me in peace. Lord, because they put, used to put over that skin, animal skin, so that they would be dipped in poison or dipped with fire. It would quench the fiery darts. That's, that's the idea. Uh, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation, because that's where, it, when it goes at your heart, when he's coming at this, what kind of Christian are you anyway? Begin to believe that you are not, you're not even saved. That's such a lie. But he, he's trying to cripple you to make you ineffective. So take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This, the, the, the Word of God is not the Logos. It's not reading the Bible. It's the rhema of God. That you hear something and you say, that's right. I can fight with that. When Jesus was tempted, what did he say? It is written. It is written. It is written. When you know the Word, when you know the promises, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. If God can be, if God is for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in me than, than he that is in the world. And you start quoting those things, the word of God, the truth of God's word, which now begins to function as a, the, for the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing asunder, even the spirit and, and the flesh and the bone and the marrow. That is the word of God. And it's not the logos, it's the rhema. It's so you're sitting in church today and you're hearing something about you. You are righteous. You can make a difference. The Lord wants to utilize your life. Let him give you vision. Where he gives vision, he gives provision. And every place you go, you make a difference. You know why? Because Christ lives in you. We're occupied till he comes. We're supposed to take territory till he comes. And the last one is, uh, that's six, that's seven. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now, it, the, the, in the Greek, it doesn't start with the word praying. It starts with the word dia, which, the Greek word dia, which means because of or to move through. How do I release all these things? Moving through prayer. Moving through prayer. What kinds of prayer? Prayer, there's prayer of petition, where you just ask the Lord for something. Supplication is where you're doing battle and you're fighting in, in, in battle. Uh, and, and, and in the spirit, praying in the spirit. Well, you not just pray in the natural, but you pray in the spirit, uh, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 
that, that the seventh, and, and oftentimes this is omitted because it's not part of the, a soldier's thing, but believe me, of the seven things you need, the, the, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the, the, the uh, shield, the, the helmet, the sword, above all, through this happens, it happens through prayer, through declaration, through releasing things, through your lips. God changes things through you, releases things through you. And so be prepared. And not only be prepared, but be on the offensive. When you feel like things are coming back at you, get on the aggressive side. Start, start walking. Start talking. Start declaring. Start releasing the Lord to work in different situations. If you're having problems in any of these areas, if you're having problems physically, we want to pray for you after service. If you're having problems spiritually, we want to pray for you after service. If you're having problems with infertility, we want to pray for you. If you're having problems, my marriage, part of the thing is we don't want to tell anybody. Well, I don't want me to know. Everybody in church thinks I'm perfect. Can I just say this to you? Nobody thinks you're perfect. <laughs> Nobody. Nobody thinks you're perfect. Turn to somebody and say, you're not perfect. But you are righteous. But you are righteous. You're not perfect, but you're righteous, and you're being perfected. You know why people don't come down for prayer? Too proud. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves on the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. <coughs> He'll take care of the problem. Whatever the problem is, I've had this back problem for a long time. I've had this headache for a long time. I've been to the doctor, had MRIs, had cats get, they can't find anything. Guess what? It's probably spiritual. So the Lord wants to touch you physically, emotionally, mentally. I get these thoughts all the time that come in my head. If you have suicidal thoughts, that is a demon. Lying thoughts about, about, about God's character, about people that you know. Listen, Believe the best. If somebody, that's why it grieves the heart of God when we talk about somebody. There's, the Bible says that he hates seven things, and one of them is sowing discord among the brethren. If you hear somebody talk about somebody else, stop them. That is demonic, and that's sowing awful seed. You need to sow seeds of grace and love and mercy and kindness. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. If you need to forgive somebody today, forgive him. Let that bitterness become sweet. And start blessing people instead of cursing people. Releasing, the, what, what would Jesus do? That's what he would do. He would bless people. 